Alright guys, how's it going? Nvidia finally announced Ampere, what they are calling the GeForce RTX 30 series, two days ago. In the somewhat bizarre setting of CEO Jensen Huang's kitchen. Although we had already witnessed another presentation from the same venue back in May, that was during their GTC keynote. But from the gamer perspective at least, this latest one was far more interesting. And there were plenty of questions waiting to be answered. Was Nvidia's next generation really going to be manufactured on Samsung 5 nanometers, as I had theorised? Or would it be the more likely TSMC 7 nanometers, or indeed the long assumed Samsung 8 nanometers? Was it really the power hog that the massive cooler and leaked 350 watt TDP suggested? And if so, was that due to an insane increase in overall performance? Was it because of RTX? Or was it, as Igor over at Igor's lab suggested, partially down to the increased power demands of the all-new Micron GDDR6X. All of those questions will be answered soon, after I take a look at the early part of the presentation. Jensen, who is finally beginning to look his 57 years of age, came bearing gifts for GeForce gamers around the world. Four gifts in total. First, big news. Fortnite is turning RTX on. Now Minecraft and Fortnite, the number one and number two most played games in the world, have RTX on. Fortnite will get ray trace shadows, reflections, ambient occlusion, and DLSS 2. The first gift was the news that Fortnite was now an RTX enabled game. And as you also heard, Minecraft already was. And you probably already knew that as well. Those are the number one and number two most played games in the world. And it's like I said back when Turing launched, RTX is here to stay because Nvidia will force the ray tracing issue through. The second gift was Nvidia Reflex. Jensen described how their new technology improves reaction times. And here's how. Nvidia Reflex optimizes the rendering pipeline across CPU and GPU to reduce latency by up to 50%. In September, we're releasing Reflex with our game ready driver. Over 100 million GeForce gamers will instantly become more competitive. Valorant, Fortnite, Apex Legends, Call of Duty Warzone, and Destiny 2 will be the first to integrate Reflex technology. If that sounds somewhat familiar to you, it's probably because AMD has had a similar technology for well over a year now, maybe even two years, and that is Radeon Anti-Lag. So there's nothing new here from NVIDIA, but it's good to see that they are at least putting some effort into catching up on AMD's fantastic software suite. Gift number three was NVIDIA Broadcast, and I have to say this looks pretty nice. We already knew about RTX Voice from a few months ago, and so that's been bundled into a new suite of applications, which now also includes virtual background effects and webcam auto frame, all AI based and Virtual background effects allow you to blur your background to varying degrees or replace it all together with another, much like you would do with a green screen, but without all the hassles of having a green screen. This is impressive stuff to be frank and, as you might expect, you can also superimpose your image over some gameplay. Finally, auto frame is like having your own personal cameraman, in the sense that it will follow you as you move around on camera. All of this is about saving time while creating content, which as any content creator will tell you, is invaluable. The final gift born by Jensen was NVIDIA Omniverse Machinima. It could be a huge time saver if you're creating that kind of content and it'll be in beta in October, but I'm gonna skip over this one. I can't recall an NVIDIA presentation in recent times that didn't talk about ray tracing, or RTX in their case at some length. This next part probably won't be much of a surprise to you either. NVIDIA, seeing the ultimate limits of rasterization approaching, focused intense efforts over the past 10 years to realize real-time ray tracing on a large scale. At SIGGRAPH two years ago, we announced the NVIDIA RTX. Now, two years later, it is clear we have reinvented computer graphics. RTX is a home run. All major 3D APIs have been extended for RTX. RTX is supported by all major 3D tools. RTX tech is incorporated into all major game engines. There are hundreds of games in development and thousands of research papers of new rendering and AI algorithms enabled by RTX. Just in case you didn't get the message before, RTX is here and it is staying. And it's because Nvidia are forcing the issue. But their RTX plans go a little bit further than simply co-marketing RTX games with publishers. DLSS, 
Deep learning super sampling will play an integral part as the technology takes over in the coming years. And Jensen explained it like this. Here's the challenge. Real-time ray tracing is far more beautiful but requires a lot more computation per pixel than rasterization. So the solution is to ray trace fewer pixels and use AI on tensor cores to up-res, to super-res, to a higher resolution and boost frame rate. We built a supercomputer to train the network. The DLSS model is trained on extremely high quality, 16K, offline rendered images of many kinds of content. Once trained, the model is downloaded into your driver. At runtime, DLSS 2.0 takes in low resolution, alias image and motion vector of the current frame, and the high resolution previous frame to generate a high resolution current frame. I think DLSS is one of our biggest breakthroughs in the last 10 years. And I have to agree with them, or at least it will be because NVIDIA are forcing the issue. Just think how many GPUs NVIDIA can sell to game publishers in order to have their games trained for DLSS on release. And sure, you can say what you want about the second image not being the true image as intended by game developers. And I have heard that argument recently, but the simple fact is it's sharper and it is much faster than the native 4K image. So I know which one I would rather be playing. And next up, Jensen claimed that by having ray tracing in the green, running concurrently with the shaders in yellow, and then using DLSS to upscale the image, the purple, the higher resolution, you can have both the image quality that RTX brings, along with the high performance that PC gamers demand. That's the magic of the three processors of RTX. And now, on to Ampere. And I think it's safe to say that everyone was surprised by some of these numbers. Jensen noted that the previous Turing flagship had 11 shader teraflops. I'm not exactly sure where he pulled that number from, or if it's just a mistake. However, it's definitely not the 2080 Ti, which was 13.4 teraflops. So this is likely to be the RTX 2080, which officially has 10.1 teraflops, not 11. Or perhaps it's the 2080 Super, which does just about meet that 11 teraflops number. Just a little ahead at 11.2. Regardless of that though, Whatever Jensen is talking about, it is clearly not the flagship Turing at a measly 11 teraflops. That minor detail paled into insignificance, however, when he followed up with Ampere's specs. An astronomical 30 teraflops of FP32 performance, around three times more than the 2080. RT teraflops were increased by 70%, 258 from 34. And lastly, Tensor teraflops increased by 2.7x from 89 to 238. NVIDIA's new Ampere GPU, our second generation RTX, 28 billion transistors built on Samsung 8N NVIDIA custom process. All three processors double rates over Turing, a triple double. Now, RT teraflops didn't actually double, but we'll forgive Jensen that minor slip of the tongue. Custom Samsung 8 nanometer node though, and well, based on the specs, it looks almost unreal. Of course, my analysis was that Nvidia would need a better node than this, make a real generational leap. However, they appear to have done it on a node that is essentially a half node of their previous architecture, Turing on TSMC's 12 nanometers. I'll have a closer look at that later, but continuing with the presentation, Jensen claimed that Ampere is an incredible two times the performance and energy efficiency of Turing. Incredible indeed. Unbelievable, in fact, as we'll see in a short while. But analysing this slide, we can figure out how NVIDIA achieved this monumental increase in performance per watt. Okay, so the frame rate on the Y axis and the power on the X. And I've chosen 60 frames per second as a comparison point with the game control at 4K. The unspecified Turing card is 240 watts at that 60 frames per second, while the unspecified Ampere card is 120 watts. Now, I say card, but it's maybe not the whole card. They do state graphics power, which of course might only mean the actual graphics chip, without including the more power-hungry memory in Ampere. And I know that some of you might claim that 6x is more efficient than 6. Yes, it is. Fair bit. However, it's only slightly better, and the new cards have much higher bandwidth, and therefore the memory will draw a bit more power than GDDR6. 
the memory angle remains important as, like I noted, the game is controlled at 4K and the current Turing generation is likely being bottlenecked by either VRAM or bandwidth. That is a guess though, so don't quote me on it. You can however quote me on this. There is no way that Ampere is anywhere near 1.9x performance per watt over Turing. At least not the gaming Ampere. Not at these kind of clock speeds. And if this is just a Turing graphics chip, they might even have overclocked it to about 250 watts just to hit that 60 frames per second. That is about the only way I can imagine they can make this 1.9x performance per watt. And of course, these benchmarks may also be including ray tracing or improvements to DLSS, in which case they are similarly misleading, or at the very best, cherry picking in the extreme. And look, we see this kind of crap every single generation with NVIDIA, but for once it appeared that nobody in the press actually fell for it. With that in mind, the following benchmarks should also be taken with some salt. In the first one, Jensen claimed that the more ray tracing is done, the greater the ampere speed up. That seems reasonable given what we saw regarding RTX improvements. However, in all of these games which utilize ray tracing by varying degrees, the speed up appears to be only around 60 to 85% looking at these bars. I mean, that's actually a nice improvement, obviously, and in line with a typical generational improvement. But again, this is in games with ray tracing turned on. And also again note this 4K resolution. Next up, NVIDIA again showed their RTX Marbles demo, which we saw at GTC a few months ago. Back then it was running on their Turing Quadro 8000 at 25 frames per second and only 720p resolution. But now with Ampere, their Marbles at Night demo was running at 30 frames per second and 1440p resolution. Now, the cynic in me immediately had me questioning the night part of Marbles at Night, as clearly ray trace scenes with little lighting are a lot easier to render. That cynicism was soon swept away as the scene was lit with many different light sources and we were treated to a visual feast of colour and lighting. This part especially with the marbles looked absolutely amazing and I assure you, this is not easy to render real time on any currently available GPU. Very impressive again, though I'm not sure about the bust of Jensen. And Jensen next showed another new technology that they are calling RTX IO. Details were rather thin on the ground, but they seem to think that it's a big deal and we will be hearing more about this at a later date. As we've seen plenty of times already, Nvidia are really good at getting their technology and branding into games. And we've known for a while that Cyberpunk 2070 would be the next big one, and we've known that it would incorporate ray tracing. And now we learn that it will also have DLSS. And when Nvidia goes on to sell millions of GPUs later in the year, compared to the few hundred thousand for AMD, this will be a major reason why. But let's get back to Ampere, and Jensen next introduced the long rumoured GTX 3080. We've known for a few weeks now, because Micron leaked the info, that Ampere would be using GDDR6X. Don't expect to see this on Navi though. The next benchmark that Jensen showed, again showed us why we can't trust any benchmarks coming out of Nvidia. Let me just remind you of the previous one where we saw and heard that at 4K, with ray tracing on, Ampere was around 60 to 85% faster than Turing. But now? 3080 is twice the performance of 2080. Twice the performance in multiple popular graphics intensive games. Once again, note 4K resolution. And this is apparently an average. How exactly do you get an up to in an average of games? Only Nvidia marketing knows. Ladies and gentlemen, Nvidia GeForce RTX 3080, our new flagship GPU. Wait, what? The 3080, the new flagship GPU. I'll analyze that one later. It was at this point I realized that the 30 shader teraflops number given earlier was actually for the 3080 card, which seemed even more unreal. With 10 gigabytes of GDDR6X and coming in at $699, the price was yet another major surprise, and I'm sure many expected quite a bit higher. Availability will be on the 17th of September and stock will be very, very low initially. I've got numbers from multiple AIBs, but I can't say specifically. However, we're talking tens of thousands of cards worldwide at launch. 
The next car to be announced was the 3070, which Jensen claims is faster than the 2080 Ti. If that is the case, it's clearly not by a lot. That didn't make a whole lot of sense when the specs were announced as 20 shader teraflops. Even if we assume that the average Founders Edition 2080 Ti operates closer to 15 or maybe even 16 teraflops in a typical gaming load, this 20 teraflops 3070 should be a fair bit faster than what it appears to be. I'll analyse that soon though. The 3070 has 8 gigabytes of regular GDDR6 and it starts at $499, which again, probably surprised a few people. Availability for this card will be in October. But now, for the final reveal of the presentation, I'll let Jensen do the announcing. Come here, Papa. Alrighty. 3090 is a beast. A ferocious GPU. A BF GPU. 36 shader teraflops. 69 RT teraflops. 285 tensor teraflops. And it comes with a massive 24 gigabytes of G6X. 24 gigabytes of GDDR6X and a whopping price tag. And there you have them. The first of what is certain to be a much larger family of Ampere GPUs. And with all the announcements done, it's time to move on to the analysis. What on earth just happened there? The event was a mix of bizarre, taking part in Jensen's kitchen with him rather unprofessionally clearly reading from an auto cue, and the usual slick demos and video from NVIDIA marketing, and of course, the usual bullshit benchmarks. But I guess the best place to start is with the card specs. Literally nobody was talking about 30 and 36 teraflops cards coming from NVIDIA this generation till Jensen announced them. According to the NVIDIA.com website, the 3090 has an insane 10,496 CUDA cores, while the 3080 and 3070 respectively have 8,704 and 5,888. And incidentally, this 8,704 is exactly twice the number of the 2080 Ti. And so the teraflops calculation is rather simple. It is just twice the clock speed of 1.7, multiplied by the 10,496 CUDA cores, and that adds up to almost 36 teraflops. The first problem with this though should be rather evident. The performance that we've seen does not appear to be anywhere near what would be expected of such a huge number of flops. Nvidia were only claiming up to 2x the 2080 for the 3080. Yet as I just mentioned, the 3080's got twice the CUDA cores of the 2080 Ti and almost three times the CUDA cores of the 2080. That is a very large difference in performance versus what the expectation might be based on this number of CUDA cores. And then, on my second watch through of the presentation, I noted Jensen saying this. Ampere is a giant leap in performance. Ampere does two shader calculations per clock versus one on Turing. 30 shader teraflops compared to 11. That is interesting language, which doesn't necessarily mean twice the number of CUDA cores. In fact, you might be forgiven for assuming that it doesn't mean twice the number of CUDA cores. Otherwise, why did they even say it like that? The plot thickened further as, over at Twitter, Kamachi posted two Gainward RTX 3090 flyers, one which clearly shows 5,248 CUDA cores. This is for the 3090. But then after the presentation, another one showing 10,496. Same graphics card. And also interesting was that a couple of days earlier, video cards got info that Ampere was manufactured on a 7 nanometer node, not 8 nanometers. And it just shows how difficult it is to know what is actually true until the reveal, as these companies are getting smarter at misdirection. Not one single leaker had the real Ampere specs, and even up until the launch date, Nvidia kept us guessing. There's no point crying about it though. If you're in the leaker game, you're gonna get played eventually, either through bad luck or by design. In this case, Nvidia won and the leakers had varying levels of success, but nobody was correct on the final specs, even as late as the last day. And at this point of the video, I had planned to analyze what I thought was going on with the CUDA cores. However, Nvidia saved me the trouble in this AMA over at Reddit. When asked to elaborate a little on this doubling of CUDA cores, the answer was, 
As a result of the new design, each Ampere SM partition is capable of executing either 32 FP32 ops per clock or 16 FP32 and 16 int 32 ops per clock. All four SM partitions combined can execute 128 FP32 operations per clock, which is double the FP32 rate of the Turing Beaming Multiprocessor. And so it seems that they really have doubled the number of FP32 CUDA cores. But why then does performance fall far short of expectation based on teraflops? On Twitter, I had theorised that perhaps the SMs didn't have a full doubling of all resources. However, in the same answer, doubling math throughput required doubling the data path supporting it, which is why the Ampere SM also doubled the shared memory and L1 cache performance for the SM. And also, total L1 bandwidth for GeForce RTX 3080 is 219 gigabytes per second versus 116 gigabytes per second for the RTX 2080 Super. So in the end, it may simply be a case of either clock speeds that are holding the architecture back. And looking back at these boost clocks, 1.7, 1.71 and 1.73, that looks a little bit curious compared to what we've seen in previous GPU launches. It's almost like it's nearly capped. But more likely, the bottleneck is elsewhere. It's possible that in order to cram so many CUDA cores in there, they've had to be trimmed somewhat and the individual ALUs are just a little bit less beefy compared to Turing's. Now, in a move which is likely to upset many of the tech press, Digital Foundry got early access to an RTX 3080 and from what I can tell at least, they also got paid for their trouble. The end result of that was this video showing performance compared to the previous generation 2080. I'll use these numbers over at their sister website, Eurogamer, for the sake of brevity. On average, these 4K, again, benchmarks with some ray tracing elements and also some with DLSS on, the 3080 was 78.3% faster. That's over Borderlands 3, Doom Eternal, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Control. And a few commenters concentrated on the use of DLSS and ray tracing. But for me, this use of 4K over and over, both in NVIDIA's presentation and now also in Digital Foundry's video, to me that is just as telling. If you recall back when Turing launched, NVIDIA were similarly keen to show 4K performance. I explained the reasoning behind that as likely being down to the new architecture having higher memory bandwidth, which is always the case with every new generation. Again, back at the Turing launch, NVIDIA compared the 2080 against the 1080 with the 2080 having 40% more memory bandwidth. Now the 3080 is being compared against the 2080, and the 3080 has a whopping 70% more bandwidth. That has to count for quite a lot of performance at 4K, especially when ray tracing is turned on, as we know that ray tracing is memory bandwidth intensive. Also worth thinking about is that at low resolutions, a lot of these CUDA cores might struggle to find work leaving the cards with somewhat mediocre boost clocks to drive the performance. If you recall what Mark Cerny said during the PS5 presentation a few months ago, there's more to graphics performance than simply teraflops. Block speed counts for a lot, and block speed was a large part of the reason why Nvidia pulled so far ahead after Maxwell. And again, if you recall, I speculated back at the Turing launch that the cards would likely perform a fair chunk worse at lower resolutions. And that was proven correct. I would speculate on that happening again here. And yes, I understand that NVIDIA are trying to show their cards in the best possible light, as they should. However, I would wager that most people don't have 4K monitors, even in this $700 price bracket. 3440 by 1440 ultra wide, 144Hz, that's becoming cheaper and more popular, and I wouldn't mind seeing more benchmarks done at that resolution now. Just keep in mind that most of us are not going to see anywhere near 78% faster than the 2080. And also note that both NVIDIA and Digital Foundry compared the 3080 to the older 2080, not the 2080 Super. Now moving on to the elephant in the room, which is the pretty astronomical power draw for this level of performance. In a recent video, I talked about how NVIDIA had plenty of levers that they can pull in order to stay ahead. No matter what AMD does, NVIDIA always seems to have an answer to it, a lever that they can pull. And over the past eight years, since Kepler, their x80 class of graphics card has been made out of their 
four class GPU. For example, the Maxwell 980 was GM204. The RTX 2080 was TU104. With Ampere though, they're using the two class of GPU instead for the X80. And recently the two class of GPU has been reserved for the 80 Ti and the Titan class of graphics cards. This means however that the RTX 3080 is in another power bracket entirely compared to anything that we have seen since Fermi. With a graphics card power of 320 watts, that is 49% more power than the RTX 2080. Nearly 50% more power for what is lately around 60% performance improvement on average. That's not really impressive from an architecture standpoint at least, when you consider the node improvement from TSMC 16FF to this custom Samsung 8 nanometers. Furthermore, the increased power levels have clearly been an engineering challenge. I'll just let you listen to this recent ASUS video talking about Ampere. As a result of increased power demands, Users may need to reevaluate the power rating of their PSUs. And even if they have high power PSU, if it has been run hard for a number of years, its voltage regulation may no longer be adequate to cope with the fast load changes. In such instances, the systems may crash when under load, leaving users puzzled. And in order to aid troubleshooting, we've developed an onboard circuit that monitors the PSU rail voltage and it's fast enough to catch any transient that results in the real voltage dropping too low. If that happens, LEDs will light up, so you're well aware that your PSU wasn't able to keep up with the current demands of the GPU. Hey, it's a simple feature, but one that will prevent a lot of head scratching if random crashes are experienced. Bizarre stuff indeed. Power is the price you pay for the Ampere generation, and it is the cost of Nvidia cheaping out on this old Samsung 8 nanometer node. I think we will see some of the highest return rates from an Nvidia series in a long time. As I noted earlier, Jensen rather strangely labelled the 3080 as the flagship for this generation before going on to introduce the 3090. I will analyse that comment more in a near future video and instead have a quick look at the real flagship card. Now, it really is an absolute monster at 36 teraflops. However, it's only got 20% higher core count and 20% higher memory bandwidth compared to the 3080. So it's hard to imagine it being much more than 20% ahead of the 3080. And 15% seems a bit more likely. And therefore the insane higher price of 1599, was it 1599 or 1499? Regardless of which one it is, it makes zero sense to anyone, except for those who really need the 24 gigabytes of VRAM. And even with that, I'd be more likely to wait on the 20 gigabyte 3080 instead. But don't be surprised if Nvidia ends up badging those as 3080 Ti's. Same GPU, just double the memory. And the 3090 also has a very high graphics card power of 350 watts. But given all that extra VRAM, that seems like a small increase compared to the 3080. I think the much lower price of the 3080 tells more than one story though. There was also the 3070 of course, but to be frank, I am not really excited about this one nearly so much. It's the 3080 that looks the real pick of the bunch if you're in the market for a $700 card. Stuff like ray tracing might not be ready for prime time even yet, but there's a very obvious progression in place and as I said multiple times already, Nvidia will just make it happen. DLSS, another major benefit which will drive even more sales Nvidia's way. And what Nvidia appears to have done here, and please do be aware that we have got zero independent benchmarks or reviews yet, it's quite impressive from a performance point of view. And from an engineering perspective, it looks like a marvel. Over 10,000 CUDA cores on an 8 nanometer node. Had that core count been known, nobody would have believed it possible on 8 nanometers. They just about had the power in reserve to make it work. That lever that they could pull in order to get the performance they needed. But on a real cutting edge node like TSMC 7 nanometer enhanced, Ampere would be absolutely screaming fast. But of course, had it been so, it would simply have meant more segmentation and much higher prices. Instead, Nvidia has delivered a near generational upgrade in performance on what is essentially a half node at Samsung 8 nanometers, which has come at the cost of power. 
you're likely going to need a new power supply for this one. And you're likely talking close to another 150 to 200 bucks for something that powerful. When you factor that in with the cost of the 3080, which for me is the clear pick of the bunch, it makes Nvidia's decision to go on 8 nanometers just that little bit harder to swallow. We'll soon find out what AMD's reply is. And I'll catch you later, guys.